demagogues. So personally, we may dislike dislike them. I, I dislike a lot of personal traits that Trump has, but but he he reached those people who were being dominated by the elites, and, and he struck a responsive chord in them. And 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 I think that's what Rockport is getting at. We, we we don't love the demagogue, but we love the fact that the demagogue has has gotten around the elites. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Tom Sarouf. Our guest today is Dr. Joseph Salerno, who received his PhD in economics from Rutgers University. He is Professor Emeritus of Economics in the Finance and Graduate, graduate Economics Department in the Lubin School of Business of Pace University in New York City, as well as the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics and the academic vice president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, where he held the inaugural Peterson Luddy Chair in Austrian Economics. He also holds the John V. Denson II Endowed Professorship in the Economics Department at Auburn University. He's the author of many articles, essays, and books, and is joining me today to dive into the work and thought of Murray Rothbard and Austrian Economics. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Dr. Salerno. It's great to have you. It's my pleasure, Tom. Thank you for having me. And before we continue with our interview, I'd like to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is Educating for Liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling this mission, make sure to head over to Apple Podcasts to rate and review this podcast to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Dr. Salerno, we want to focus our episode today on the work uh, and thought of Murray Rothbard and his scholarship, but I think it'd be impossible to do that without discussing uh, the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, you know, for our ISI pro honors program, I remember reading uh, Wilhelm Rupka's, uh, some of his essays, as well as that of uh, Friedrich Hayek. Uh, and when you read their writings, you know, they're championing freedom, free markets. Uh, they critique government intervention in the economy. Uh, you know, I think it, it's Hayek who's famous for the knowledge problem, though I'm sure he's not the first to, to make that observation. Um, but if, to start off, if you could help sort of ground our discussion and help our listeners and myself understand further what people mean when they talk about Austrian economics, uh, especially as how that differentiates between other schools, say that of the classical school or uh, supply side Keynes. So what is Austrian economics? Um, Austrian economics began in, in 1871. It was actually founded by Karl Menger a great intellectual figure in, in, in the history of economic thought and in intellectual history in general. But to make a long story short, Menger, um, who was who a, a journalist, was watching the markets and noticed that the explanation of how prices were determined, that is by the cost of production, um, was completely wrong because prices in the markets were changing from day to day, from moment to moment, if you were talking about commodity markets or stock markets. So he came up with another explanation for that. And what he did was, without going into a lot of detail, he traced back the um, determination of prices to people's subjective wants and ch the, their choices and actions based on how important they believe these different wants were. So Austrian economics has since grown tremendously since Menger's time and basically traces all economic phenomena, business cycles, firms, markets, mo even money. Um, back to the actions of, of, of individuals. It's sometimes called the method of um, a methodological individualism, uh, but it's really a broader method. I, I hate to use the term, the big, uh, big terms here, but praxeology, which is simply the study of action. So it uses the, the, this praxeological method, starting from the actions of individuals and then deducing logically, step by step, how prices are determined, um, where money comes from, uh, you know, how interest rates and rents are determined and so on. Okay. And one of the things I was, I'm not super familiar with Austrian economics. So this is a, a great learning opportunity for me as well. But I was reading okay. up a little bit uh, in preparation for, for the podcast. And one of the things that came through was a difference or a distinction between economic history versus that of theory. Uh, and so it sounds that Austrian economics is a theoretically, though you did mention just praxeology. So it's but a sort of, I guess, a theory of praxis. Um, yes. So what is, I guess, what's the distinction there, if you could draw that out further? And I think that might also speak to what you were saying about how a lot of economists maybe are missing the mark on 
the value of prices or something like that. So if you could. So, yeah, ec- Austrians aren't against economic history. In fact, they do it. I mean, uh, Murray Roth, Bard will talk about, wrote a book on America's Great Depression, what caused it. And that's a, a great historical episode. But the difference for Austrians between economic theory and economic history is a, is a difference in method. So when you're doing economic theory, when you're trying to explain how prices arise, when you're trying to explain, you know, what entre- entrepreneurs do, um, what, what, what you do is it's based on general experience. That is, we all know that we act and, and we all even can understand that other people act. And to the Austrian, that simply means that they purposefully use means to achieve their most important ends. And from that insight, um, Austrians and Rothbard in particular um, can deduce all of the implications of that into a whole theory, construct a whole theory of economics. So we're not saying it's it's mystical or that it, you know it just it, it, it's it's just all in your head. What we're saying is that you can use logic to um, based on some basic facts of of reality of both subjective and objective reality. You can deduce the whole of economic theory. Then now economic history comes in um, in explaining how certain things occur, how the, um, the the banking crisis, the recent banking crisis occurred, or or how the um, America's, what would cause America's Great Depression, or what caused the Great Depression of the 1930s. That's an application of the theory that was worked out prior to the individual concrete episodes of history. And one other thing I might want to add, um, Austrians do not believe that you can test the theory by looking at facts. In fact, the facts are dumb, as we say. The facts don't speak to us. The facts have to be interpreted. And the only way to interpret those facts is through a body of theory. Okay, that's making sense. And then I guess if the theory of economics is drawn from an understanding of human action and subjective value that we each have, um, which maybe I'd love to actually hear you delve a bit more and sort of, I guess, concretize what that means, the subjective um, subjective value of each individual person. But I guess, so the question is two parts. There's, I'd love to see more, uh, you explain more, like how, what that actually looks like in practice or what the subjective value means as opposed to objective value. Um, but then also how politics and e- how economics is related to politics, if we understand that politics also draws on basic facts about the human person. All right, let me talk about some subjective value for a moment. Um, uh, the Austrians were the first, well, I mean, there were a few others before them, but, but, but the Austrians resolved through their theory the, um, what's called the paradox of value. Why is it that diamonds, which cater to frivolous human needs and, you know, just conspicuous consumption, um, are much more valuable than bread or water, which are, are used to keep, which keep human beings alive? Um, and the Austrians pointed out that it's it's a matter of the scarcity of of, of the thing and the of value and 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 the importance of the want that it served. So um, for people in someone in a desert who has a, a, a diamond worth twenty million dollars, uh, the graph pink diamond, which was sold for forty six million dollars at auction a few years ago, that person, if he had not he or she has not had water in in, in two or three days would trade that diamond for a gallon of water. It, 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 the cost of production of the water and the diamond have nothing to do with it, with, with, with determining the price. The, the price is paid because people have reverse values. So in a normal situation, of course, a diamond is much more expensive than a gallon of water or a loaf of bread. And the reason being that, that d- d- um, bread and water are, are so abundant, fortunately for us, that the very lowest want that it serves for us has a very low value. And that's the value of every unit of water. Because if you lost one unit of water, if you lost a gallon of water, if you lost a loaf of bread, you, you, uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't uh, deprive you of something that was very important to you at that point. Whereas if you lost a diamond, in a normal situation, it, it certainly would. So I give my uh, students the if I look, following example. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Witness with Harrison Ford, which is about the... Uh, it, takes place in the Amish country in southeastern Pennsylvania. The Amish are a sect, religious sect, that really are um, against any sort of 
um, conspicuous consumption. They don't even have buttons on their clothes. They have hooks and eyelets. Um, but for the Amish, a diamond would be worth zero. The, an, an Amish would not pay even a penny for a diamond because that's something that, that, that's considered showing off and so on. So that, that's subjective value. If all Americans suddenly took on the values of, of the Amish, then what would happen would be that the, the, the price of diamonds would collapse to zero. The uh, high wages of, of, of jewelers and, um, and others, and, and also the prices of diamond mines, if they couldn't be used for anything else, would all be zero. So what Menger pointed out was that the value of the ends determine the value of the means. So its price is determined costs, not the other way around. And that's the classical school. The classical school believed that because the cost, a diamond had a high value because it cost a lot to, to dig a diamond out of the earth. But that's certainly not the case. Whether you find a diamond on a beach or you dig it out of the earth at great cost, it's going to have the same price if it has the same quality and the same uh, desirability to people. Okay. Well, with that primer in mind, let's turn to uh, Murray Rothbard. Um, and I guess the, an opening salvo would be, you know, who is Murray Rothbard? What is, what is he about? And how does he situate himself? Or how is he situated within the, the School of Austrian Economics? Okay, uh, let me just point out that uh, I, uh, Patrick Newman, a uh, uh, professor at Florida Southern um, College, and myself are writing a book on Rothbard and, and how he developed as an economist. So we've been looking at a lot of his archives. Um, but, but Murray Rothbard was a student of Ludwig von Mises, who's really, I would say, the, the dean of the modern Austrian school. Uh, Mises' book, Human Action, which um, was published in 1949, really saved the Austrian school from just disappearing. And Rothbard carried on Mises' tradition. I think he went in a number of ways. He went beyond Mises, which, which we'll talk about. So Rothbard was, was a libertarian before he came to read Mises. He was very dissatisfied with the mainstream economics he was learning at Columbia University which was either institutionalism, which kind of uh, uh, um, denigrates all economic theory, uh, and he was also learning the emerging Keynesian economics and um, a, a micro, mainstream microeconomics. So he's just satisfied with them. Uh, but he found out through the Foundation for Economic Education, which was a libertarian um, institution, uh, a very venerable one, that there was a... Louis von Mises was in the United States, was writing a book that would appear within a few months. To make a long story short, Rothbard got in touch with Mises, read very quickly through human action, and became converted to Austrian economics almost immediately. He wrote Mises uh, a letter when, when he was halfway through the book saying, this, this is economics whole. This is what I had been searching for. Um, so uh, that's, that's sort of his background. Um, he came, you know, he was um, came from parents who were Jewish immigrants, and our grandparents that were Jewish immigrants, and uh, most of his family were he he said were communists, uh, except for him, he, he was not. Um, so when there was a big discussion of the Spanish Civil War, um, everyone was bashing Francisco Franco, who was the right, the leader of the right, uh, rightist movement that was fought, fighting the so-called loyalists, who were really just communists, and. So he was a nine-year-old or a ten-year-old, and he says he remembers piping up when they were bashing Franco. What's wrong with Fra Francisco Franco? So uh, he was a libertarian from from a very young age. Well, that's interesting. It's just because my understanding of Franco is, and maybe I have the history wrong here, but that Franco was more authoritarian, right? Not necessarily, you know, a Nazi or a fascist like Hitler or Mussolini, right. but certainly not somewhat of a libertarian ilk. You know, this is anticipating what we might talk about after, but I'll, I'll, I will say Rothbard um, points out that Franco and also Augusto Pinochet from Chile, who also overthrew a communist dictator, um, are hated by the left. They're more hated than Hitler. And, and, and he, he puzzled over that, and he came to a the conclusion. The reason why they're, they're, they're more hated than Hitler was because they overthrew social democrats. Um, that overthrew the, 
people who were elected, leftists who were, who were elected through democracy. And democracy is, is a great god of the left. And that's why they're so hated. And by the way, that's why Trump, Bolsonaro, Orban, Milano in Italy, uh, that's why they're so hated. Even more than Franco and Pinochet, because they got elected well, you know, after, you know, uh, you know, uh, through a reactionary movement. And that's what the left hates. The fact that democracy was actually not working in their favor to progress towards a, a socialist utopia. So just while we're on the subject of uh, Rothbard's politics, I read your, your article, um, Rothbard versus the progressives. And uh, one of the things that he called for, one of the things that you described in that article is that how Rothbard in the 90s uh, called for a, a, new, a realignment of our po politics uh, and what he called for was a, a reactionary right. So can you explain to us what's the reactionary right? What's the realignment all about now in the 90s? Um, and who's in and who's out of that coalition amongst, I guess, the existing groups, political groups at the time? Yeah, so um, in, the, in the 1990s, the aftermath, of course, of the, uh, of the fall of, of the Soviet Union and, and the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, and Rockwood recognized that the Cold War was no longer an issue dividing necessarily dividing, um, let's say, traditional and c cultural conservatives on the one side and rational libertarians, sort of right-wing or mainstream libertarians um, on the other side. Uh, so what he called for was a fusion of these two groups because neither of these groups were progressive. Neither of these groups sought, believed that there can be a, a, a heaven on earth um, that, you know, that... that um, well, I, I forget what Buckley called it, was the uh, imminentizing, imminentizing of the eschaton, the bringing down to earth of, you know, of, of, of sort of a, a heavenly um, environment. So, Rock, so Rothbard um, very, very um, vigorously called for, for this realignment. And this is right before he died. I mean, in the three or four years before he died, he wrote, wrote a number of, of very Im important articles setting out this new strategy. People who were in were the non-progressives. The people who were out were the um, the 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 the, polit the, the uh, progressive politicians and 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 their cronies. I mean, he was you know in, in the in the business world that was that was beginning the high tech stuff was beginning then. Um, in particular, he he focused the um, uh, po political cadence from our side on on the Clintons at the time. Um, and, and, and he made a very important political point, and that was that we have to make, what, what, what we have to attack the people who are actually in power at the time, because especially if, if, if they are defective individuals, if they, if they have personalities that are, you know, like Clinton did and, and, and Hillary did, because once, once you know, people loathe, uh, you know, his, his philandering and so on, but that then would lead you to, to look more closely at his politics and, and, and to see that they go together. And so um, Rothbard said the greatest nuclear fusion in politics is, is fusing the personal with the political, the personal hatred, the hatred of the, of the, the man or the woman with, with the hatred of their ideological position and the insight that what they're trying to do is, is, to, is to impose their values, their corrupt, rotten values on us. Okay, and one of the other things that I found so, especially yet, yet last, with this is it's great that we're recording today. Last night is the the Trump indictment comes down, and Trump was often called a demagogue uh, in 2016 and in 2020. But Rothbard actually, and this is I think the first time I've ever heard someone say that demagoguery is a good thing. But he even calls for demagoguery, um, and I, so I found that very interesting because I think maybe a lot of conservatives would bristle at the notion that our political hopes would rest in the hands of just you know, one man or one woman who's, uh, has, a, has uh, a lot of political charisma and is able to move the people. Cause I, you know, I think of John Adams is the right. famous often cited quote, we've created not a, a we've, we've created a government of laws, not of men. But what's, what's his thinking there on why yeah. demagoguery is good and necessary? He wrote, he wrote that, uh, an article on demagogy in, in, in 1954. And then later on brought it back up again, the demagoguery that you're talking about. Um, well, look, look at Trump. I mean, Trump was rhetorically brilliant. He brought back the phrase America first, which had been tainted with, you know, 
dark hints of Nazism and and you know being 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 against uh, the uh, the American Crusade in World War II and so on. But yet, as a Democrat, he started a movement. Um, Trump didn't didn't have any more power than any the other presidents presidents before him. But what he did do was to reach around and short circuit the elites and their control of the legacy media. Um, so demagogues, though personally we may dislike dislike them, I, I dislike a lot of personal traits that Trump has, but but he he reached those people who were being dominated by the elites and, and he struck a responsive chord in them. And 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 I think that's what Rockboard is getting at. We, we, we don't love the demagogue, but we love the fact that the demagogue has has gotten around the elites. Um, and he pointed out Joe McCarthy was someone who was like that. Though so he didn't agree with his ends, he said. He agreed with his means. Because McCarthy was a cold warrior too. Um, right. but, but he just used means that, you know, he, he especially attacked the bureaucracy and U.S. Army. And when he did that, he was pretty much finished. Right. And then uh, in the other, I think Rothbard's known for coining the term anarcho-capitalism. Um, and so, of course, that's part of the libertarian, uh, the libertarian discourse, I guess. What is anarcho-capitalism as opposed to, I don't know, just regular capitalism? I don't, what yeah. is anarcho-capitalism? Well, laissez well, Rothbard was reacting to laissez-faire. He used to be a laissez-faire capitalist when he was younger. Um, and... Some of his socialist friends that he argued with at Columbia University said, well, if you don't want the government to, to run steel, steel mills, um, why do you want, want, want the government to, to provide protection? And so Rothbard, of course, turned that on its head and realized, no, we can have governance structures and, and protection structures and um, protection against foreign invasion that is provided by the market. So anarcho-capitalism, we're not against, we're not in favor of anarchy in the strict sense or the, the um, conventional sense of that term. We're in, in favor of anarchism that is without government, but that doesn't mean without governance structures. With Every property owner would have, have rules for their own, own property. Uh, for example, Disney World um, doesn't have much crime. Um, they're very good at providing protection for their paying customers. Uh, hotels malls, and so on. What we're saying is to allow all property to be private. And once that's done, then the property owner will be responsible for the protection of himself and his guests and, and clients and visitors and so on. Um, so it's not as radical as it sounds. I think it's, to me, since I am an anarcho-capitalist, it's, it's common sense. But, um, I, uh, but, but so I, I'm certainly willing to, 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 to to be comrades with with people who want uh, you know a limited government, people who want our old republic back. I mean, uh, I think now's not the time to stress these differences. Now's the time to to, to take America back, to go back to the old republic, or to go back even to the 1950s to begin with. Okay, then of course, as an anarcho capitalist, we push it further, but um, that's something we can discuss. That's very interesting. I guess one of the things that I, I might, that comes to mind is perhaps an objection would be like foreign policy. Uh, how does foreign policy? I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I think like most prescient today would be like, how are we going to deal with China um, without some sort of more overarching coalition or what would I, I guess a government structure like a federal government um, that would have to take steps in order to push back against a creeping Chinese. Yeah, right. insurgency that's rising to and i think they'd certainly want hegemony over us so i i wonder what the anarcho-capitalist um rejoinder to stopping a country like yeah. china would be um, I mean, I, so to begin with we, we would say we need a national divorce as far as as a movement towards anarcho-capitalism i mean we're not there's no it's not practical to say we're going to jump into anarcho-capitalism i know I'm, I'm i'm temporizing here but um but if we had many independent states in the United States, there's, there's nothing stopping an alliance against foreign invaders. Um, and the same thing would be true on, under anarcho-capitalism. There would be a, a few big insurance firms um, uh, and other types of agencies that would provide protection. And uh, 
look, we, we would have, because the government's so inefficient we, and also takes so much in taxes and, and reduces the, our wealth, we'd be a lot wealthier. We'd have um, better and more sophisticated weaponry. We, we, you know, we're not saying to disarm. We're not, we're, and offer capitalists aren't necessarily pacifists, so maybe a tiny minority may be. Um, so uh, that's, again, something that we can, you know, we can, we can, we can talk about. But, but I think the key is to stop the left in the United States, not to worry about the Chinese right now. I mean, they're out there, and, 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 but, but, but the, the threat to our liberties, the threat to our livelihoods, even the threat, I mean, to, to our freedom, uh, you know, not being thrown in prison for, for cro- things that aren't crimes, uh, is, is the progressive left, and, th- and they have to be stopped. Fair enough. Um... I guess to talk about Rothbard as the economist, we, you mentioned that towards the beginning of, that Rothbard was a student of Ludwig von Mises uh, and then a contemporary of many of the other Austrian school scholars, including yourself, including Hayek. Um, and as I understand it, he had a number of disagreements with Hayek uh, about various points of, um, of, I guess, politics and economics. I, I think he even called uh, Hayek's, he wrote a review calling Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, quote, an evil book. Um, so what is the nature and scope of the disagreements of, uh, between Hayek and, and Rothbard? And who would you say is best vindicated in those, in those uh, debates? Okay, so there's, on the economic side first, um, in business cycle theory, Hayek was a great business cycle th- theorist. That is, he, he explained in how inflation almost always led to recessions. However, his disagreement with, with Rothbard there was Hayek believed that that business cycle theory was endogenous. And all I mean by that, that it could, that inflation and recession could come from the market economy, as well as being caused by government expansion of the money supply. But he thought that banks were part of the market economy, fractional reserve banks, and that they could cause on their own uh, a business cycle it may not be as um, uh, uh, as deep uh, or, or 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 as destructive. Excuse me, as destructive as a business cycle caused by government, the central bank increasing the money supply. Um, but but it, w- it would be generated by the market. There, Rothbard opposed that view, and I think he showed in America's Great Depression um, through his economic theory that. Um, all business cycles are exogenous. That is, they're caused by factors outside the market economy, basically by government intervention into the monetary system through its central banks. So that was one disagreement with, with Hayek. It was a very big disagreement. Um, an, an, another disagreement with Hayek had to do with the socialist calculation debate, um, which, which I, I kind of got involved in in 1989, 1990. I wrote an article that influenced Rothbard quite a bit, and then he wrote a very good article on it. Um, but bottom line is that Hayek believed that the problem with socialism was that there was so much knowledge out there that you needed to run an economy and it was all dispersed. Um, well, that's certainly true, but uh, Rothbard and myself and, and other Austrian economists believe that the real problem was what Mises initially pointed out, and that was calculation. That is, entrepreneurs a lot of different knowledge, that's all true. But the way to, to bring that knowledge together, or, or, or it's, it's not really knowledge itself that's, that we have right now. It's, it's um, trying to uh, um, forecast the future. So basically, how does an entrepreneur uh, operate? He operates by trying to figure out what prices of the goods he wants to produce will be in the future under uncertainty, and then to, to, to use those prices to bid for the things that he needs to produce those goods. If the prices he expects exceed the cost of buying the things that he needs, the factors um, to make those goods, well, then he'll, he'll undertake the project. So what Mises said was that under socialism, um, because the state owns all the, the, the factors of production, all, all the material factors of production, you know, all the capital goods and, and the land and so on, um, that there... There is no market, so there's no prices. There's no prices for those things. So we never know what the cost of what, of what we're producing. So we produce inefficiently, we produce the wrong things. That, that is not a knowledge problem. 
That's what we call a calculation problem. Um, sure, you do need knowledge about what's happening right now, but but that but to focus on that and make that the main problem of socialism, Rothbard thought was wrong. I think that was wrong also, and I think I think our side, because there are some Hayekians who take his position. I think our side of the uh, uh, in Austrian economics got the better of that debate, though there are other people, not, uh, some of whom are friends of mine, who would say otherwise. Now, let me get to your, um, the difference between Rothbard and, and, and Hayek on, on politics. Um, the reason why Rothbard called that an evil book, and, and uh, it was in a letter, he, he uh, was much um, more favorable toward the book um, in, in, in his regular published writing, um, was uh, on the one hand, Hayek, who had written the great book, The Road to Serfdom, came out in favor of a, a sort of a welfare state um, in the later chapters of that book. And Mises also criticized him for this in, in a review of the book. Um, and Rockwood, I mean, uh, Hayek was in favor of a universal basic income, basically. Um, today, uh, of course, they don't want it to be means tested. They don't want any, any work requirement, uh, whereas, whereas Hayek did. But, but so that was one, one thing that uh, Rothbard took issue with. The other thing was Hayek's definition of coercion. For Rothbard, coercion is, is simply the use of physical force or the threat of the use of physical force um, in an aggressive manner, in a manner that invades property rights. Um, so he was in favor of negative liberty. Liberty was a negative thing, was to, to, to leave people alone. Um, Hayek also said that he was in favor of negative liberty, and, and, and in a way he was, but he had a very fuzzy, confused concept of what a, a liberty, uh, what, uh, or, oh, I'm sorry, of what coercion was. And, 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 and that was that it was um, the actions taken by one man, he used the term man, uh, to get another man to, to, to um, do things against that man's will. And he said, yes, coercion by government is one form of coercion, or, or physical force by government is one form of coercion, but there are other forms. And he even pointed out that a nagging, a continually nagging wife will cause the, that man to change his choices and actions. And, and so that's a for, he didn't want that outlawed, but it, it's a form of coercion. He had a very broad and confused um, uh, notion of coercion. And I think that's why Rothbard in the letter, remember, not the published work, called it an evil book okay that makes sense so there's some um I, I guess differences of not only technical economic issues um but also some even maybe some broad first principles uh and their relations to politics and i want to ask them how did you first get in, interested in rothbard's work um and then within the austrian school as well well um when I, 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 I told a story, it's 